welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Sarah. And I'm Clay. We're a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. I am literally losing my mind this week because we have our very first podcast guest, um, incredibly talented author and endlessly patient friend, Kristen J. Miller. Her debut novel, Seven Rules for Breaking Hearts, just hit the shelves last week, and I bought a million copies and am obsessed with it. Kristen, welcome. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I know you have like a thousand other hobbies going at any given time, so I really appreciate it. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm I'm really, really excited to talk to you guys today and kind of get into the history of Catalina Island a little bit. I'm excited because I know like... Just, I know the one, like, really famous, like, true crime thing that happened there, but I don't really know a lot else about it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, just for a little bit of context for everybody listening, uh, Catalina Island is the setting of my novel, and I want to talk a little bit about the weird Hollywood history behind the island. I am very excited about this. And, like, Clay, you, you took, like, some film study stuff in college, too, so this should be some fun for you some stuff you probably haven't heard about i'm very excited i don't even know what to expect (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um basically santa catalina island is like 20 something miles off the coast of southern california um it's part of the channel islands which is like a whole chain of islands and i think some of the other ones are technically a national park but uh catalina island is the closest one to la which is kind of why it has the hollywood association and am I remembering right from the book that it is not actually 26 miles? <laughs> yeah, oh, I know yeah, that was something that, that your main character was like very upset about. Yeah, well, so and that came up when I was just like thinking about it one day. I don't even remember why I knew like I knew it is 27 miles, not the song, but just like if somebody was like, oh, how far away is Catalina Island? I would have been like, uh, I think 27 miles. Um, And so I was thinking about the song when I was writing and ended up kind of looking it up like, why is the song 26 miles? I don't think it's 26 miles. Well, I think there is like, if it's like a straight shot from LA to Avalon, which is the main city, I think that is 26 miles, but there are literally no boats out of LA. It's either (laughs) Long Beach or I think um, San Pedro or Balboa. So like, nothing to do with LA basically so I don't really know why the Great. song is 26 miles <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't it be you know what it just sounded it sounded better in the lyrics I guess <laughs> yeah um so uh, anyway to kind of I guess continue with my little brief background um the island has a history that dates back to like 7,000 BC or something like that when it was settled by the Tongva uh, Native American people whoa but of course it uh ended up being settled by Europeans as things do um (laughs) and so uh (laughs) from from there obviously things changed it was kind of gradually developed but the Catalina Island as we kind of know it today is actually sort of the doing of William Wrigley Jr. as in the chewing gum guy oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) okay uh, very random um but he i guess as like a group investment thing purchased a portion of the island in 1919 basically fell in love with it and so uh, according to the catalina island museum he basically decided he was going to use his marketing chops to put the island on the map so to speak so he bought out everybody else and just set about improving the roads and hotels and things kind of just took off from there that is wild yeah like, just my my little vacation hobby thing um i'm just gonna turn it into a tourist industry like an entire it's fine don't worry about it yeah <laughs> Why not? um which then kind of brings us to how it caught the eye of hollywood um basically around the time that wrigley bought it it was still you know the silent film era Um, And so it was already being used to film motion pictures here and there. I think there was like an adaptation of Treasure Island, um, (laughs) Ben-Hur, things like that. Um, But it was like really favored as a filming location because obviously it's proximity to Hollywood. And then also because most of the island was pretty much untouched. So if you wanted that kind of just wild, far away from civilization kind of look, there was really only just the one small city and then the rest of it was just these rolling hills and expansive ocean and everything like that so it sounds like it would be 
perfect for just about any kind of island thing. Like, had they filmed Lost 100 years earlier, it would have been just perfect. <laughs> and had to go all the way to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. So, and there are, like, a bunch of weird little, like, one scene or two scenes in random different movies that have been filmed there. Like, I guess, like, specifically the underwater scenes in Jaws were filmed there. And I do not understand why... They couldn't have filmed those off the coast of Martha's Vineyard where they filmed everything Too else. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, maybe well, that. Well, from what I understand, because um, like for some godforsaken reason, um, I'm a Jaws expert and I understand it as filming took so long and uh, Spielberg was just ready to get back home. Like he was tired of being in Massachusetts. They were having all these problems that went so far over. So he was just like, yeah, I'm fucking it. I'm taking back to the West Coast. And like some stuff they even like filmed with the uh, mechanical shark in somebody's swimming pool. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. See, I, I had, I did not know that. I just, I knew that they had filmed a couple scenes there on Catalina and I was like, why? <laughs> so that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that kind of leads me to uh, one movie in particular, or at least it's debated which movie is responsible for this, but um. I want to jump to the present for a second to kind of lead into it and let you guys know that in 2009, the Los Angeles Times published an article titled Catalina Bison Going on Birth Control. Uh, wow. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> an attention grabber. So, yeah. 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 Um, when we kind of rewind again back to the silent film era, uh, somebody at some point brought bison over to Catalina Island, but it's... There's this big debate over which movie it was for and when exactly it happened. Uh, it's kind of generally accepted that it was probably when they were filming like a Western of some sort, mm, most yeah. likely a Zane Grey novel adaptation. But there's just a little bit of the history is kind of muddled about which movie it was exactly. Um, so, of course, that led me down a rabbit hole trying <laughs> to figure out which movie it was. <laughs> um, and so from what I can gather, they were trying to film a Zane Grey novel called The Thundering Herd all the way over at Yellowstone Ooh. in like 1923, 1924, something like that. And the director basically brought back some of the bison with him and just dropped them on Catalina as a sort of safety deposit in case they needed to film bison in any future <laughs> movies so that they wouldn't have to go back to Yellowstone. <laughs> cool. You know, why not? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So um, those bison were all male, actually. Um, and then William Wrigley Jr.'s son, who had taken over the island about 10 years or so after his father bought it, uh, ended up buying some female bison <laughs> in 1934, and you can pretty much guess what happened from there. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so that brings us back to the LA Times article. And uh, yeah, it, basically by the late 90s, the population reached like 500 bison on this little tiny island. Oh, wow. That oh, was I... never supposed to have bison in the first <laughs> place. Well, you said that this... You said that it was... Um, it was made specifically for like um, filming like jungle scenes and things like that. Things that you wouldn't really have access to any in any other place in California, right? Well, not not so much jungle scenes. It, I mean, the island is actually pretty dry. Like when you get up into the highlands of Catalina, it's kind of just these like rolling kind of grassy hills. I oh, think there's okay. like native cacti. I think it's more just that there wasn't I mean it was just completely untouched hadn't been settled there were no roads really cutting through it to speak I of see. that sort of thing um but yeah it's not it's not really jungly or tropical per se I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's gotcha. on me but, for mentioning um, lost I think that's where we went wrong <laughs> well I was thinking <laughs> if they were trying to film image. like Tarzan and then you see just some bison <laughs> in the background that's not going to make any sense at all no it would not yeah <laughs> Yeah, um, so no, it's it's definitely more of a, um, I guess, typical kind of Californian, what, what do they call that, a Mediterranean, is that a Mediterranean climate? I'm pretty sure it's a Mediterranean climate. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, because like, yeah. it's so arid. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, really dry. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, but the bison managed to sort of thrive there against all odds i say sort of because i guess it you know they were kind of 
they, they haven't grown as big as bison normally get and things like that. So that was part of why they wanted to kind of keep the population under control is they just figured this wasn't the ideal location for them. And so in 2009, they basically put all the female bison on birth control, <laughs> um, which has been pretty effective. And they also have transported some of the herd to reservation lands in South Dakota. Um, and I guess today there's around 150 bison left on Catalina Island, according to the Catalina Island Company, which is like the island's big kind of uh, tourism department type tour- tourism entity, we'll say. Um, but yeah, so they're they're definitely still there. People do tours to go see them. <laughs> and there's actually a local mixed drink called buffalo milk that does not have any actual buffalo milk in it oh, or God. bison milk, I should say. <laughs> um, no, it's kind of like a, a white Russian type drink with like I think it's like Kahlua and a couple other things. Um, But it's served basically like every single restaurant at the island (laughs) on the island serves this same, like some variation of the same mixed drink as like a nod to that part of their history. (laughs) Well, and I appreciate you clarifying what that is because I had like, I read um, in your amazing book, you know, somebody ordered that and had to be, you know, I promise you there's no milk in this. There's no dairy or whatever. And I was just like, (laughs) okay, but why is it called that? Ew. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm, I'm really glad to have that clarification. <laughs> it it definitely raises some questions, yeah. And then also for some reason, it you know notice it's called buffalo milk and not bison milk. Right. I don't really know why everyone on Catalina calls them buffalo. They almost never call them bison, but they are bison. It's just for some reason they're more known as buffalo. I don't know. Bison milk doesn't really. It doesn't have it doesn't, the same like the same... zippy little sound to it as buffalo milk. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> No, you're totally right. Um, But yeah, so that would just be one of the noteworthy uh, filming related aspects of Catalina's history. Um, I already touched a little bit on Jaws. Of course, there's probably one of the most iconic movie references to Catalina is Step Brothers um, (laughs) with the whole Catalina wine mixer thing. Um, But slightly infuriating fact, apparently Step Brothers didn't actually film any scenes on Catalina Island. Oh, that's rude. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So all these other random movies use Catalina Island, and then Step Brothers <laughs> actually has scenes set on Catalina Island. And they were just kind of like, eh, you know, I don't actually know where they filmed those. Scenes. They missed the ferry um, that day, and they're like, just you know, fuck it. I don't feel like going anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to what I read, um, like they still use like some like stock footage. I think maybe there's like an aerial shot. It's been a little oh. while since I watched it. But I think they just pulled like an aerial shot and then they just filmed the actual scenes. Just, <laughs> who knows where? Some random Southern California location. We got some B-roll <laughs> off of um, like stockphotos.com. And uh, other than that, you know, I just I couldn't be bothered that day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then a couple other movies that were filmed there. Uh, I guess part of a dream sequence in Rosemary's Baby. So that's Oof, fun. Wow. Um, and then there are scenes in The Hunt for Red October, uh, The Thin Red Line, Apollo 13. Most of them are ocean scenes. So it's okay. like a lot of them, they didn't use the island itself. It was more, I think, that the island was just like a convenient launching point to then get those shots that really feel like you're in the middle of the ocean away from that makes the sense. mainland. I don't know. Okay. Um, but uh, it also kind of around that time became a favorite destination of a lot of Hollywood celebrities so like Charlie Chaplin was a regular visitor um, Clark Gable Joan Crawford which leads me to one celebrity in particular who briefly called the island home before she was famous who could it be I'm so excited (laughs) Uh, a 16 year old girl named Norma Jean arrived on the island in 1943 Newly married, having dropped out of high school to be a housewife. She went to Bison Island? (sighs) (laughs) So, yeah, Marilyn Monroe, uh, smack dab in the middle of World War II, married her first husband, and he joined the Merchant Marines, which apparently resulted in him being stationed on Catalina Island. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Poor poor Jim. He... uh... He really thought he was doing something, marrying the prettiest girl in the neighborhood. (laughs) Best of luck to you, friend. (laughs) You look like a potato. It was never going to happen. Oh, no. Poor Jim. I'm sorry. Um, But I said what I said. 
<laughs> now, at this point, she was not involved in Hollywood at all, right? Right. So, like, uh, not to be that guy. So, they got married when she was 16. They were married for, like, a few years, not very long. But that is when she started modeling. Because while he was away at the war, she had a job in a factory. And so somebody came in to take pictures of like, oh, look at the women on the home front. And they're like, holy shit. Who is yeah. this gal? So, Yeah, from what I heard, uh, exactly how long she lived on Catalina is a little unclear. So I don't know if you, do you know exactly what year it was that she was kind of discovered like that? You know, I really should. Um, I want to say like 44, 45, somewhere in there. Because it was like still during the war. Like it was still going on. Yeah. That, that sounds right, because basically, based on what I was reading, like, even, so the Catalina Island Museum, like, they've done a lot of research into trying to figure out, I think they even did a whole exhibit on it, but, like, a lot of what they've tried to look up, they've basically just been like, well, we don't know for sure, like, the, the records aren't super clear, because there's, like, different sources say she lived on Catalina for six months, maybe to a year or two, but two would probably be pushing it, so it seems like the six month six months to a year kind of window um but apparently she actually really loved it there um at least according to various sources that do not quote her directly <laughs> so <laughs> that could be you know a tourism marketing type thing but who's to say i mean that does make me want to go so i get it well, so a lot of people, it, her um, house on the island, or supposedly her house, again, mystery surrounding it, <laughs> nobody can confirm, um, supposedly she lived in this little house, it's like right across from a hotel, I actually stayed in the hotel, um, the Hotel St. Lauren, and like a lot of people visit just to like go look at that house that she maybe supposedly lived in, but we can't confirm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would do that. I'm, I'm 100% yeah. on board for this field trip, but let's go. <laughs> That see that that's very dedicated. That you know you don't know <laughs> if it was her house, but it might have been. So you know, good enough. <laughs> you know, I think if um, I was like standing in the yard, I would feel it in my heart. I would be like, oh, she, for sure she was here. Or I'd be like, nah, man, get me out of here. I'm gonna grab a buffalo milk and like just get back <laughs> on the ferry. I'm pissed. Well, so one of the only like pieces of evidence I could find about the location was like I think it's from. Jem's memoir mm. about like his life. I think he wrote a whole book. He did his time with her, didn't he? Yeah. Um. So I think like he describes that like they lived in like a, a multi-family home and that they had a porch that had a view of the Wrigley Mansion up on the hill. Oh. Um. And so that's kind of I think what everyone's been going off of. Um. The museum themselves said that like yeah they had a PO box like they have records of the PO box but they don't have any records of like what the physical address was so like yeah who's to say um but the one thing the one other thing I did find about and this maybe was also from his memoir was that she would uh, frequently play with the kids in the neighborhood um out in the road in front of their house so that's really like the only descriptions there's like two pictures of her standing on the island like towards like this one it's this like planter type thing in the main square and then there's supposedly her house and yeah, she would play with the kids in the streets. So that's about all all that really seems to exist from that period of her life. Well, if anybody is worried about it, don't be. I will definitely put that picture on our Instagram so we can all look at it together. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there were obviously some celebrities and soon to be celebrities who lived there. But of course, now we get into one of the big mysteries, which is a celebrity who died there or at least right off the coast. I am. I don't want to say excited because that is grotesque, but um, yes, do go on. <laughs> so, um, Sarah, actually, you were the one who called attention to this because I was not familiar with this particular association with Catalina Island until you mentioned uh -huh. it to me. Um, but Natalie Wood, the mystery of Natalie Wood. Oh, boy. Yeah, this one is a uh, it's infuriating because we still don't really know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, again, rabbit hole. I sent myself down a whole <laughs> rabbit hole after you brought it up with me. And it's like, how did I never hear about this? You know, I mean, I suppose it's one of those parts of history that the island wouldn't want to promote mm -hmm. so much. That would be a little, little dark tourism, probably, yeah. for their taste. But, but yeah. uh, I don't know. Like, there's, um, 
I was looking it up again today just to kind of refresh myself on some of this stuff. And I do like I want to go back and see if like that restaurant is still open, like the last meal um, that the the party had before they set sail. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. What, what's the restaurant called? I didn't even come across. You know that. what? I'll look it up because now it's going to bother me if I don't. I, f- I feel like it's, it's on like it's in Avalon. I Catalina. think so. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely on the. Oh, God. It is Doug's Harbor Reef and Saloon. Fine food in Grog. I do. I, th- I think that's one of the ones on the main strip. That sounds familiar. I'm going to I'll text you a picture of it so you'll know what I'm talking about. But yes, please, please continue. Don't let me interrupt. Oh, yeah, yeah, it totally, it totally is. So it's not called, it's not called Doug's Harbor Reef anymore. It's just called Harbor Reef, but it still is the same restaurant, (gasps) apparently. So it's still there. That's so exciting. Okay. I think I ate an artichoke there once. (laughs) (laughs) Of course you did, obviously. (laughs) Um, yeah, so anyway, to, to delve into uh, the parts of the story that aren't food oriented. Um, yeah, so I actually, you know, to be entirely honest, I didn't know who Natalie Wood was. As, you know, we've discussed before, Sarah, I am terrible with pop culture. <laughs> um, so I, I hadn't even heard anything about her. So um, I guess she's best known for like Rebel Without a Cause and West Side Story, right? That- and um, Miracle on 34th Street. She was the little girl. That oh. was like her big break. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So she was a child star at first. Yeah. And that was something that was like, she was kind of the first actress, like, or one of the first actresses ever to kind of make that transition from child star to like serious adult actor. Okay. Interesting. Um. So, yeah, I, I mean, uh, do you want to kind of segue into the events of November 28th or shall I? Um, I I would just say, you know, that she was um, involved with Robert Wagner off and on. Um, so hmm. they were they were married at one point, like in the 1950s, I want to say, like for a few years, got divorced. She dated some other people. She dated Elvis. Hello. Um, and then she remarried Robert Wagner and they had, um, I believe it was a daughter. They had a child together. Um, do you know about the fortune teller? No, oh. I did not see. I knew you were going to know. What, like, <laughs> I, I went down a rabbit hole, but it wasn't enough of a rabbit. Okay. Hole. <laughs> so the one thing that I will say before we kind of, before I kind of hand it over and let you like really get into what happened. So, Natalie Wood's mother, um, when she was young, like well before she was married and had children, I think she actually might have been like a young girl, like maybe a teenager herself. She went to see a fortune teller. This fortune teller told her that she would have a daughter who was beautiful, talented. She would be famous, but make sure to keep her away from dark water. So Natalie's whole life, her mom is like not only pushing her into acting and being just like an awful like stage mom, but she's also instilled in Natalie this terror of the water. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I did come across like her sister commented on the events after the fact and said, well, you know, she never would have gotten into the water willingly because she was, she couldn't swim and she was terrified. Oh of yeah. It. So that makes sense. Interesting. I did not come across that at it all. It is very creepy. Yeah. So uh, I guess to segue from there um, into where the water comes into play here, um, basically, and of course, Sarah, jump in at any time <laughs> if I'm not providing the necessary details, but basically my understanding is it was kind of a weekend boat trip to Catalina with her husband, Robert Wagner, and her co-star, Christopher Walken. And then I think there was the captain of the boat as well. Yes. Um, they were in the middle of filming Brainstorm, which I guess is a sci-fi. I have not seen it. I haven't seen anything, unfortunately. That's my problem. I mean, that one doesn't sound um, like it's that. The only reason I've ever even heard <laughs> of it is because of what happened. So uh, it's probably not great. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've never heard of it. Um, and uh, so they were on her husband's yacht, Splendor, and uh, her body was basically found the next morning one mile from the boat with an inflatable dinghy beached on shore. And the circumstances surrounding the situation are very suspicious. 
So yeah, to say the least, very, um, very odd. So from what I remember, the um, she and Christopher Walken have been filming this movie for a little while. Everybody on the set is like, I don't, they're, we, they're not being like affectionate with each other, but there's like, there's this little, there's an electricity between them. Like this off camera chemistry is like cuckoo cabanas. Um, so that was kind of why Robert Wagner wanted to invite Christopher Walken to come like, Oh, spend a weekend with us. And like, I'm really going to set you straight. Like this is my wife and we're in love and I will just kill you if you don't back off kind of was the vibe. Um, they started fighting the three of them at the restaurant the night before. So they were, and the, um, the boat captain was with them at the restaurants, the four of them at the table. They're like already arguing. Um, so other people at the restaurant hear them arguing. And then despite this, they all still get on the yacht together to sail around the island. And on the yacht, they're drinking wine and champagne. Like everybody's drinking. So this is not good. And then another fight breaks out. Christopher Walken is like, dude, I'm just trying to have like a baller weekend. I don't need this. And he went to his room. He's like, I'm going to bed. Like I'm done with this. He reported this later. At first, he was lying to the police. He's been upfront about the fact that he lied to the police. Um, But he and the boat captain both later came out and said, like, yeah, they were screaming at each other in their room. Like, we heard glass breaking, like a bottle gets broken. And then there's a splash and the yelling stopped. People on another boat, um, not too far away, around 1130 that night, I want to say, they heard somebody screaming, help me, I'm drowning. And after about yeah, I, 30 minutes or so, they didn't hear it anymore. I, yeah, I, I did come across that that part when I was researching things. And just the the denials and the lying and how just, you know, somebody's not telling the truth here mm-hmm. is I think right. kind of. It's kind of the impression, um, because I, from what I read, Wagner basically denied they even had an argument at yep. first, and then later admitted that they had. And, you know, why are you changing your story like that? Yeah. And of course, it's like, you don't want to, <laughs> if you are innocent, if this genuinely was an accident, I wouldn't like, because I listen to true crime literally while I'm asleep at night. Like I fall asleep listening to murder podcasts. I wake up listening to murder podcasts. It's like a real genuine problem I have. But like it would occur to me to be like, I am not going to tell them we were fighting because then they are going to think I did it. So from that, I can like see it from that angle. But then you have to consider the fact that like when they pulled her out of the water, she was wearing her pajamas and socks. Like she's not even wearing Uh. shoes before she gets in a dinghy despite being terrified of the water and she just like goes back to shore in pajamas and socks okay sure and and there were bruises kind of all over her weren't there oh, yeah. that kind of seemed to indicate yeah, yeah and like a I... cut i think one cut either like her face and her hand or something which kind of speaks to hearing like walking saying he heard like the bottle breaking the glass breaking or something and it's just kind of something yeah, happened it's... And from what I read as well, um, the 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 death certificate was updated in 2012 to kind of make it less definitive, right? Yes. And initially they said it was just drowning and hypothermia that killed her, but then they kind of updated it and said, you know, well, we can't can't say for sure. And her husband was named a person of interest mm-hmm. not that long ago in 2018. Finally. Um, yeah. So, but he's refusing. Uh, he yeah. will not speak to police or detectives at all just oh yeah since they reopened it he was like no i'm not even no i'm not even gonna say a word to you about it like okay why why is that yeah how how old is he actually now he's got to be up he's in his 90s i want to say i don't i mean the last time i was aware of him was in the austin powers movies um oh who is he again me i never watch movies he's number two (laughs) okay all right, so he's 93. He is still alive. He is 93. Maybe maybe the plan is just he's trying to just wait it out, and, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe he didn't expect to still be alive at this point. Like, I don't know. I don't know, man. I know who I think did it. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, legally, I won't say. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, once again, another situation on Catalina that's kind of surrounded by a lot of mystery. There seems to be a pattern here that things are not very well documented <laughs> when it comes to the history of this island, yeah. uh, one way or another. <laughs> well, you know, I got to say, like, if I'm going for island vibes, I don't want to be doing bureaucratic stuff either. So, yeah, there's fair that. enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you for tuning in, spending some time with us today. Hopefully you enjoyed Kristen's story. If you didn't, never speak to me again. But if you did, run out right now and get your copy of her debut novel, Seven Rules for Breaking Hearts, which just came out last week on May 16th, and which I guarantee you'll love because she is obviously brilliant and amazing and the most interesting person I probably have ever met in my life. Um, you can find her on Twitter and Instagram at Kristen J. Miller. And you can find us on those same platforms at Fantastic H Pod. And we'll have links to her um, socials in the show notes this week as well, as well as a copy to go ahead and order that book. Um, you can also email us at fantastichistorypod at gmail.com if you know of any amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history that you'd like us to cover on the show or if you just want to say hello. Until next time. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks for being Thank here. You.